Hello, everybody. I think I'm recording. Yes, I am. In a few days, I'm going to Los Angeles to give a talk to an audience of oligarchs, i.e. billionaires and allocators of huge amounts of capital, billions and trillions of dollars. And I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, genomics, and how they will affect what it means to be human in the coming decades. And uh, as much as I like the oligarchs, uh, I thought I would share this talk as well with a broader audience. So I'm recording this little video. And if I'm doing it right, uh, you can see a little picture of me. And uh, you can see the four slides that I'm using for this talk. Since the audience will be non-specialists, uh, I've tried to keep uh, the figures as simple as possible. And uh, what I hope to do is uh, only speak for a relatively short amount of time and then just go to questions. And I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting conversation following the, uh, the main part of the talk. Now, let me start by discussing the current state of AI. AI has made tremendous advances in the last five or 10 years, largely due to an architecture for learning, which we call neural nets or deep neural nets, which is really quite old. So the basic idea that you could create some kind of synthetic network that is modeled after the brain so that it has uh, individual nodes and connections and it feeds information from nodes to other nodes through those connections, that idea is extremely old. And uh, when I was a young physicist uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were already many people working on it. But the idea was largely abandoned for at least 10 years or so um, because people couldn't make progress. And what has changed though is that uh, we now have much more data available to us. We have much more powerful computers. And we've dealt a few additional tricks for the training of these networks. And as a consequence of those advances, we've seen really huge uh, progress in AI to the point where the way I like to characterize it is that um, almost any narrowly defined task, if you can define the task narrowly enough, computers can now perform that task better than humans can. So among those tasks are things like uh, image recognition, so face recognition, the ability to read handwriting, the ability to recognize people's voices, synthesize new voices, um, the ability to read fingerprints, the ability to uh, perhaps safely drive a car uh, under, you know, under fixed conditions or positive conditions. Those are all narrowly defined tasks which computers are extremely good at. And I think we can anticipate that what is meant here by the definition of narrowly defined task is gonna broaden quite a bit. So what people my age have to look forward to in the remainder of our lives is a period of time where computers will be getting smarter and smarter and invading areas of human activity and getting and gradually becoming better than humans at those activities, but perhaps not quite reaching what we might call artificial general intelligence or an intelligence which has some kind of common sense or sense of the world, a theory of how the world works. If you take a little kid and you have them and uh, uh, you show them the world, they, they learn remarkably fast. And uh, that speed at which they can uh, learn about the world and form a model for how the world is um, currently isn't understood from a theoretical viewpoint. And there isn't any neural net uh, or deep learning architecture that can reproduce what little kids can do. To give you an example, uh, if I go to the mall and I walk by a pet store, I can say to my son my, uh, or a little kid, um, gee, how much is that doggy in the window? And my son will immediately understand that the doggy in the window uh, is for sale, that the pet store is a place where people go to buy pets, and how much refers to how much money one has to pay the owner of the store to get the puppy. No neural net or deep learning architecture or artificial intelligence is anywhere near currently being able to understand all those contextual aspects of the world uh, and therefore would have a very tough time interpreting the sentence, how much is that doggy in the window? 
So there's still a gap to be closed. Um, I think it will eventually be closed. Experts differ as to how long this will take. Some people think it's imminent, maybe in the next couple of decades or a few decades. Some people think it might take another 100 years. Um, I used to be in the camp that thought it would take on the order of hundreds of years, but uh, now I'm, because of the rapid progress in AI, I'm starting to think it might happen sort of toward the end of my life. That would be the most uh, rapid pace at which this kind of thing could happen. Regardless of what you think the timescale is for the advent of AGI, or artificial general intelligence, um, nevertheless, humans will be interacting more and more with smart machines. Those smart machines will have a kind of alien and strange intelligence that is not like our intelligence. But again, for narrow tasks, we will often find it uh, the wise thing to do to defer to the machines. So the machine which tells you, um, wow, you better go get a checkup because something's funny with your pulse and blood pressure. Or the machine that says, um, do you better sell that stock because we noticed stuff happening uh, in the last few milliseconds in markets all over the world. Or the machine that uh, says, yes, this is in fact a picture of um, your cousin, uh, which we recognize by the similarity to your face and uh, by, by uh, comparing it to old photographs that we've seen before. In, in tasks like that, it'll become increasingly common that the machine is better than the human and humans will gradually have to learn to defer to the decisions of machines uh, which, uh, whose, whose internal processes they really don't understand. Um, to illustrate that a little bit and to, and to explain a bit more what a neural net is, I've included this first uh, figure that's on the screen. And what it shows is individual nodes connected by different um, uh, links. And the strength of those connections is what is determined by the training of the neural net. So you, you show the neural net lots of data and you have an algorithm to either strengthen or weaken uh, individual connections. Those are the little lines in the picture, depending on how the neural net performs uh, on the task uh, that you're training it for. And at the end of the day, you might have, say, a million different uh, strengths of connections that have been fixed by the optimization. And um, if you take some simple model, like uh, let's suppose the strength of the connection is discrete and it only has 10 values, you know, one is very weak, 10 is very strong, then immediately for a neural net with say a million um, individual connections, so th those are the, the little lines on the graph, um, you might have 10 to the 1 million different tunings of that neural net. And for some tunings, it might be very good at recognizing dogs and for other tunings cats and for other tunings human faces um, and each of those uh, without maybe changing the architecture very much each of those tunings uh, will do a very different thing and the reason I'm em emphasizing this is because um, if you actually think about whether a human an ordinary human could understand what the network is doing um, that boils down to the human actually looking at maybe some list of a million connection strengths the, the individual strengths uh, through which one of the nodes on this picture influences another. Um, and from that, figure out something, something qualitative about what the uh, neural net is actually doing. And you can see right away, if uh, we're talking about a million parameter neural net, uh, which isn't necessarily the biggest one one can think of, one can think of much bigger ones. Uh, the human brain has um, many more connections than that. Um, you see immediately that there's no simple way or narrative uh, explanation that uh, humans can give for what the machine is actually doing. Um, one example of this is the program AlphaGo, which plays Go better than any human ever has, uh, or maybe ever will. Um, but even the programmers who built it and trained it don't really know, they can't really look into the network and actually say very much about what it's actually doing in detail. So this set of technologies that's moving AI forward very quickly is really phenomenal, but uh, it has a character, an intrinsic character, which is actually more a little bit more like biology than standard programming. So if you've, if you've ever programmed a computer in the past, uh, you remember that there are things like do loops and um, go-to commands and all kinds of things that humans can understand what's actually happening as the program progresses along. 
Uh, that's quite different from uh, looking at uh, the connection strengths of a million different uh, neurons. Um, one is more understandable to humans and the other one is almost impossible for humans to understand. So effectively, we've come across a technology now that's allowing us to build very complex networks that uh, process information, and they can process, inf process information in a very useful way. We can get them to perform tasks that we find extremely uh, useful or important. But our ability to really deeply understand what they're doing inside is limited by the intrinsic complexity. And so this is just the situation that we're going to have to live with. Uh, I think it's just going to get worse and worse. And eventually we'll have some very strange and alien intelligences around us that are increasingly human-like in a way that they have a kind of general understanding of the world around them and can make kind of general observations or make general decisions about the world, not just narrow ones. Uh, but humans won't really understand what they're doing. And uh, so uh, it'll be almost as if some alien species lands on this planet from a different star system. And it's obvious that they're intelligent. It's obvious that they can do some things much better than humans can, but we really don't understand them very well. And I think that's the future that we have to look forward to in the next few decades. I think it's, it's inevitable that uh, we're facing that. We'll go on to the next slide. The other big trend, which I think is gonna affect uh, humanity uh, in the next few decades is genomics. And um, because the cost of genotyping has gone down so much uh, in the last decade or so, and will continue to go down, I believe, predictably, um, we're awash in genomic data. And uh, we have uh, now fast computers and good algorithms to uh, learn from that genetic data. And uh, one of the things that we're able to do, we're uh, making very fast progress in this area, um, is to predict uh, aspects of the organism from the DNA alone. So in principle, if you gave me the DNA of an individual human and didn't tell me anything else about that human, uh, I could still predict some things about that human, whether he was short or tall, actually male or female, um, bald, uh, what color hair, what color eyes, uh, maybe how smart that person was, or maybe even what their personality type is. All of these things are already known to be at least somewhat heritable, in some cases very heritable, and so they should be largely uh, predictable from the genetic information. And what this figure shows is the genetic architecture of height. So recently, my research group used uh, machine learning or AI methods, if you will, to learn from about 500,000 individual genomes. And among other things, we were able to build a pretty good height predictor. So the machine learning train, training produced something which can predict the height of a human just from the DNA alone to basically plus or minus an inch or a few centimeters. So it can easily tell the difference between someone who's, say, well above average in height and someone who's average in height and someone who's well below average in height. And what this picture shows is um, the individual locations in the genome where the variants, the genetic variants, which affect height are located. And so if you like, it's the, a map or genetic architecture of the human genome. And the locations correspond to what you would get if you took all 23 chromosomes and you laid them end to end, and uh, the coordinate along that direction would be the individual base pair in the genetic code, and the length of that um, uh, string of chromosomes would be about three billion base pairs. And among all the different possible genetic variants in that long string, um, about 20,000 are activated by the predictor. And uh, each of the individual variants that are activated either slightly depending on which version variant you have, either slightly increases or slightly decreases your height. And from adding up all that information, the predictor can pretty accurately predict uh, the height of individual people. And this has been tested uh, in what's called uh, out of sample validation. So although the training set was uh, about 500,000 people from the UK Biobank, we've uh, actually tested the predictor in other populations like Americans that grew up uh, here and maybe many of whom never set foot in England. Uh, nevertheless, it works uh, pretty well on them. Um, and I give this example 
A, to illustrate that a really complex trait like human height uh, is actually tractable, that we can develop methods to predict these traits um, from genetic data alone. Um, but secondly, also to just illustrate the complexity. So just as in the case of the neural network where we have a neural net that really works well, we know it actually does you know, properly recognize faces and differentiate between uh, faces of different people. Um, the way that it works is, you know, almost incomprehensible because it's just so complex. It, it, it is um, taking pixels from the image of the face and then doing various transformations on them to make features and then combining those features into some kind of uh, classifier, which uh, determines whether it's uh, your cousin Al's face or not. And so again, here what we have is uh, learning, statistical learning, which results in some very complex predictor. You can check very easily that the predictor works by testing it on out of sample data. Um, but no human will really probably fully understand all the details of uh, all the complex uh, processes involved, uh, in this case, in determining the height of an individual. Um, so it's, it's yet another example of machines learning things from data, getting, uh, producing a predictor or something that's quite useful to us, um, but it will be difficult for humans to understand what is really going on. Well, how can we use uh, predictors of this type? Or alternatively, a related question is, how is this ability to predict complex traits going to affect the future of humanity? And um, here I give you an example. Um, this is an embryo report. So this is a report that uh, a couple, say, which is going through in vitro fertilization might order um, through some advanced genetic testing. And the report will predict certain traits uh, associated with, uh, in this case, embryo 4. 